and welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I hope uh, you are in for um, some really interesting conversations. Um, we have some um, extremely interesting colleagues lined up. We've got some things to show. We've got plenty to say. Um, we're going to hear uh, people talking across um, three short sections uh, in a moment. Uh, we will hear first a, a conversation between uh, Alexander Whitley and Thomas Prelberg. Uh, we'll then follow that uh, with another conversation between Andy Reynolds, Elisabetta Versace and Dylan Morrissey, and then some conversation between Jonas Patras and myself. I'm then going to open uh, the discussion across all of my colleagues on the panel uh, and hopefully following that, following that there should be some time to address questions from the audience via the Q&A function. So if you do have questions that you'd like to ask uh, in relation to any of the work that you're hearing about today you can either do that through the chat or through the Q&A function and just once again thank you very much for coming along. My name's Martin Welton. I'm a reader in the Department of Drama here at QM. I have a, a variety of interests in movement, I suppose, uh, having worked uh, in and around dance in a number of capacities over the years. But I'm not going to be speaking too much today. We're going to hear from uh, our panellists um, who are going to be uh, giving some discussion. Pardon? Oh, <laughs> so I thought somebody was intervening. Who are going to be telling us uh, uh, about their work in relation to data in motion uh, on this panel. So uh, I'm going to turn firstly to, uh, and so actually, I should just say briefly, part of the impetus for this panel came from a conversation that was facilitated by my colleagues by my colleague Eva Monks between Alexander Whitley, who is a choreographer, I'll ask him to introduce himself in a moment, and uh, another colleague here at Queen Mary, Thomas Prelberg, who is a mathematician working with data uh, in relation to movement. And uh, having, for having facilitated what's proven to be a very interesting and uh, ongoing conversation between Alex and Thomas, uh, Eva was keen to bring others into that discussion and, and that's where we find ourselves today. So if I could turn first to Alex and Thomas, if you could just introduce yourselves very briefly, um, we'll then get going with the conversation. Thank you. Sure. Shall I start? Yes, please. Why not? Okay. Um, hi everyone, I'm Alexander Whitley. Um, I am a choreographer and artistic director of Alexander Whitley Dance Company, and I've been an artist fellow at Queen Mary University for the last four years or so. Um, uh, I've uh, been, uh, I have a special interest in, um, in working with technology in relation to dance, um, both in terms of uh, what, that, what technology can bring to traditional um, theater um, context, but also the, the new kinds of possibilities that are uh, opening up through um, immersive technology. Um, and uh, um, I'm really interested in exploring the different kinds of relationships that can then be established between performer and spectator in those contexts. So um, yeah, that's me. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Thomas. Yes, I am professor of mathematics at Queen Mary. I have been at Queen Mary for now an extent of 15 years. And um, I do research these days that basically involves counting things, or in other words, exploring all possibilities of uh, situations and trying to quantify them, um, which is by itself maybe more a static exercise than a dynamic one. However, you know, when you do some counting, you also um, end up writing algorithms, writing, finding things that actually sequentially um, enumerate things. So um, maybe uh, this is all I would like to say at this point, and I'll hand back to Alex. So we've um, got a series of questions for each other, which should hopefully relate back to the conversation that um, we initially had as part of the, the conversations 
program. So um, the question I um, have for Thomas is, how does counting help us discover or understand the kinds of structures that exist in the world? Okay, so this is a very, very big question, actually. And I am, I think it's a fundamental question. One could fill a full lecture series on that one, on answering, trying to answer that one. Um, um, but I've been certainly interested in, and when I gave my inaugural lecture here at Queen Mary um, a couple of years ago, I actually went back towards the fundamentals of counting to uh, actually to describe my interests and what I'm doing. And when I was looking into the background of what counting actually means, I very much went back into history straight to the beginnings of language and how uh, people actually um, utilize counting in cultures. And uh, if you look at uh, extreme examples, which is always a good case to actually find out fundamental things, then you realize that in certain primitive uh, cultures in tribes in the Amazon basin or in Australia um, with Aboriginal tribes, you have uh, languages that don't allow more than one, two, and many in terms of counting words. And it is something so hard to actually understand from our advanced point of view what that might mean to the culture. Uh, it might mean that there was no need for any development or that there are other ways of actually intuiting what numbers mean, but you never had the reason to actually count anything beyond many. If there was nothing, that was okay. If there was plenty, it was okay as well. But the in-between, the special quantification was not really necessary. And if you move on and look at the development of numerical systems, number systems uh, throughout history, even in the, uh, the big cultures, the Babylonians, uh, the Romans, then you realize the Babylonians had a very advanced system. They did astronomy, they could do measurements, and they had an, a very advanced number system. On the other hand, the Romans, even though there was quite a lot of philosophy around in the Greco-Roman uh, area, um, they had, when it came to mathematics, a very, from our point of view, under, underdeveloped mathematical number system. Um, the Roman number system is great for one thing and one thing only in my mind, and maybe somebody will disagree with me here, happy to hear that, and that is accounting. The Romans were great accounters. They collected information, they collected wisdom from all the countries, all the areas that they actually conquered and ruled over, um, but it was more or less an accounting way. And then we come, of course, to, to nowadays uh, current history. And, and now we have, uh, based on the Indian uh, decimal system with the invention of zero, a very, very advanced way of actually dealing with counting. So this doesn't necessarily explain how I use counting in my research, but I think it's a very interesting question to look at how counting actually developed. And quantifying things, counting things, measuring things, uh, being able to really do quantitative science is, is uh, something very essential. And uh, in the big realm of things, my own counting questions could actually be seen as fairly primitive again, because I like counting discrete objects. I like counting fairly simple things. And um, so in this context, I think it might be a good point now to, for me to try to actually share a particular screen. Namely, this is something I, um, I hope this is visible now. This is something I handed over to, to Alex when we started discussing things. This is a very simple system of a fixed length uh, path on the lattice, it is self-avoiding, and there is a recursive algorithm here at play that sequentially enumerates all possible configurations. It's a fairly small system, but even here, this particular video clip, if I played it to the full, would take about 20 minutes to play. And um, of course, I am rather interested in doing the same thing for very, very large systems. Uh, but then when it comes to trying to actually turn these things into motion, uh, I also um, handed over another video to Alex, um, which I'm also trying to find right now. And 
that one is somewhat shorter and I believe I've just lost it, but it's more or less the same thing. Let's just leave it at this, this the same thing, slightly slowed down. And uh, to my great surprise, Alex actually took this as the basis for some experimentation with choreography and managed to uh, create really wonderful things out of it. And I think at that point, it might be good to hand back to Alex again. Great, right, thank you, Thomas. Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a really interesting conversation we had, and um, I guess uh, as soon as I saw these walks that uh, Thomas shared with me, I was immediately thinking of a kind of bird's eye view on a on a stage, um, and the kind of patterning that um, a choreographer might think about um, when setting a piece of choreography um, on on stage, and. Um, I uh, have taken a lot of inspiration from um, from science and mathematics in 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 my in my work um, over the years, and I think there's there's something about the the description of, of patterns in the world that has always really appealed to me because I guess I see choreography as effectively just um, patterns of movement of the body or between bodies um, uh, and the spaces they occupy, and those kind of um, abstract patterns serve as really interesting templates to then um, build layers of movement upon and um, uh, and then obviously when they're translated into the movement of the human body they um, take on a very different meaning um, and that kind of transition from the from the abstract into these more tangible meaningful forms I guess when they're represented through human movement is something um, that really interests me in terms of yeah I guess the relationship between um, the world as we know it and um, uh, and the arts as a means of communicating um, ideas about them. So um, I'll just share my screen. And um, so the video that Tom Thomas um, just played was obviously very fast and very complicated. There was a slower version that he shared with me that provided a more uh, manageable um, template for something that um, I started to create a movement sequence with uh, one of my dancers with. Um, and we kind of built layers um, uh, over the top of this and then also um, motion captured it um, and had a, um, some visuals generated from it um, by a digital artist that I've been collaborating with on uh, a project that I've been running um, since the beginning of lockdown called the Digital Body Project. So um, as well as working with um, abstract patterns of ins um, as inspiration for my work, I'm really interested in the process of capture and record, recording movement, and then thinking about or seeing what can happen once um, that movement has been rendered as a set of data points. Um, the, the kind of possibilities are uh, endless with it really. So it's, um, it's a deep source of fasc fascination for me in terms of, again, coming back to the idea of patterning, what, what, uh, the question of what remains recognizably human when you abstract um, the movement that it's been derived from and represent it through different forms. So I'll, um, share my screen and show you the, um, the little video that we put together. I have to find the video, uh, the place to play it. Here we go, sorry.
There you go. So yeah, I guess that gives uh, an indication of what emerged from our conversation. I'm aware that we've probably um, covered the time allocated to us for our, our presentation. I, I think we've got a teeny bit of time. I just wondered if there was a question maybe that Thomas wanted to ask you <laughs> about <laughs> work. <laughs> yes, so uh, one, one thing- kind of, kind of brief. Yes, so one thing I was actually wondering this context is, um, I was dealing very much with the regular structures and I, it was amazing what Alex could pull out of these. Uh, but on the other hand, I was very intrigued by Alex having done work with coming from very chaotic, very um, disorderly dynamical systems. Um, two of his works are called, has, have something to do with the butterfly effect or strange attractors, which are complicated structures uh, in no way related to these very simple objects. So there's a certain, um, dichotomy do, between these different approaches, actually. Uh, in one case, you have this very orderly structured approach um, where you try to actually fit to a fixed set of rules. And the other one, you have this, uh, again, something generated by fixed set of rules, but something that is very chaotic, very disorderly, not random, mind you, but disorderly. So, um, and how can one bridge these two things? And in, in particular, one thing that we never really covered, but that also interests me is how do you distinguish in, in dance between chaos and uh, disorder, which are two very big topics. Uh, I don't think we have time to touch that, but it's, it's super interesting. Yeah, I'll try and answer as um, succinctly as possible. But I, um, I think as that video demonstrated, the, this, the relationship between difference and repetition, I think, is really significant there. And um, the, these kind of regular patterns and re um, repeated structures provide a challenge when um, uh, choreographically in, in thinking of uh, sustaining interest over time. Each, re each repetition of the same structure poses a challenge in terms of bringing something recognizably similar, but also bringing something new and, and different. Um, so that, you know, playing with that kind of th the threshold of uh, um, those two things uh, is uh, really interesting for me. And, um, and I guess, as you point out, you know, the, um, the difference between chaotic and random systems is that they are, chaotic systems are deterministic, but un unpredictable. There's something about finding, discovering a way for um, the unpredictable to be present and to bring meaning to a situation because ultimately in theater you you kind of have a blank canvas to determine your own rules and laws so you have to work to establish those rules in the first place and then find ways of um subverting them or um bringing surprise or difference uh, because ultimately it's the difference that is the meaningful thing um in in that experience of, um those kind of time-based experiences in performance so um, I think uh, that's something, if we had more time, I'd show you another video that, that worked with um, pendulum, the double pendulums of, um, of, of chaos theory, um, which uh, we worked with as a, as a basis for just thinking about the kind of repeated circular patterns and kind of exhausting the possibilities of how the body can work within that very fixed um, idea of a uh, you know, a pathway, a particular movement pathway. Um, so I think that's something that I, I definitely found um, there to be a, um, an affinity with, I guess, in terms of your work, the idea of exhausting the possibilities. Um, we're just exploring very different areas and ways of um, exhausting things and, and ultimately uh, had different intended outcomes from, um, from those endeavors. That's terrific. Thank you. Um, super interesting. I'm sure we could we could continue with that uh, um, exhaustion notwithstanding. Um, that's great. And I would also just flag for those who are interested that um, Alex's work can be seen live uh, soon in, in real space, in a real space, in a real venue in a real city yes. called London. Uh, the theatre is called Sadler's Wells. I think it's the 20th and the 21st of next month. 21st and 22nd. Forgive me. There we go. So uh, book now, no folks. It, it's going to be it's going to be wonderful. Uh, a, a great occasion to get back into into live performance. Um, so that's the advertising over. We, we're going to um, change topics slightly. Still still thinking about um, 
about uh, motion and about data, but hearing now from a, a somewhat different perspective. So um, I, I, I was really excited to participate in some conversation um, with uh, Andy Reynolds, Dylan and Elisabetta uh, yesterday, hearing about their super interesting work um, working with dancers in relation to uh, to pedagogy to injury prevention um to a, a whole range of different ways of thinking about the, the the body in motion but um they'll speak to that much more effectively than me and i think dylan you're gonna lead us off in this conversation if that's right i think dylan was having some issues with yes please um, tell me if i struggle with with Wi-Fi, I, I set up a space to move to. Um, so, uh, good evening. Um, that's a, a tough act to follow, but um, um, hopefully we can we can do this justice. Um, my name's Dylan Morrissey. I'm a professor of physiotherapy at, at Queen Mary, and um, in both in my clinical practice, educational work, and in research, I'm very interested in the link between. Um, movement and pathology and um, we've got three people on this on this panel uh, today and um, so um, Andy would you like to introduce yourself? Yes of course um, my name is Andy Reynolds I'm another physio um, in a slightly different guise I I'm, I've been in professional sport from football cricket and then rugby for 20 years um, I've managed four people at Harlequins which went up to 43 people in a period of 15 years so the sort of the management skills there suddenly exploded but on top of the management stuff there was a clear understanding that data was a, a, crit a critical way of managing players injuries players availability and what availability means winning games so um, I was sort of over 15 years how that sort of data got so much more important um, I then decided I needed a a change in career and went from a collision sport um, to now be a medical director at the English National Ballet, um, which has been a, a huge shift in everything and understanding. I, I, my understanding in foot and ankle injuries I thought was pretty good, um, but I, as probably 90% of our injuries at present are foot and ankle related, I'm learning more and more about the foot and ankle every single day. So for me, career-wise, it's been a real challenge, but also a real interest in it. So uh, I'd be happy to talk about data in sort of in, in the dance field, but we'll be relating it quite a lot to my more experience because I've only been at EMB now for two years. And COVID has taken a bit of my time away from that now because I seem to be a COVID officer some of the time. Um, so. I think it's my turn. My name is Elisabetta Versace. I'm at the University of London. And we have recently started a project uh, in collaboration with Dylan and other uh, researchers. And um, we want to uh, respond to the situation of COVID uh, by trying to see whether this situation in which we cannot train or not always train in the studio together, uh, it can turn out to something positive. So can we learn more about this situation of learning with social distancing at home? So uh, you see behind me uh, that there is a two by two square meter uh, with a dancer. And we want to know whether we can find the best ways to teach and learn a choreography online remotely. And maybe if you're curious, you can ask me a few more questions later. This was just an introduction. Okay, great. Um, so I'm very honoured to kick this off. I'm going to show some really boring data after the, the lovely um, presentation of um, both the, the algorithm that Thomas showed and, and then Alex's multiple responses to that. I'm going to show some data um, from our lab. Um, it, is a, it is a lovely place. Hopefully this is going to behave itself. Um, and what I'd like to talk a little bit about is one of the difficulties that we have and one of the challenges is, is taking group data because a lot of the, the work that we do, we take large groups of people, we measure them, um, we, we find patterns of movement that may be associated with a particular pathology. But of course, what I've got to then do is translate this work to the individual. And um, that's a real challenge uh, in clinical practice. There's a, a huge um, time lag between discovery and implementation 
between discovering new new movement patterns that might be problematic, new treatment approaches and so on, and actually getting those applied in the clinic by all but a few individuals is really quite hard. And even I find discoveries that my team make or people that I know very well make, um, getting those into practice is really quite hard. So um, hopefully... So level one evidence, this is very boring stuff in some respects, um, looking at forest plots, but it's the highest level of evidence, looking at lots and uh, lots and lots of different studies that are combined. And you'll see that the hint is in the title of this, um, this work done by a couple of uh, students who actually called this study Rosa's Runners. She was one of our integrated students, along with Patrick. Um, and what we found is the most common knee pain problem that runners have, which is patellofemoral pain, kneecap pain. Um, not only did they have um, a way of moving that went with that kind of pain, but if we targeted those ways of moving, um, we could modify that. And that's been reproduced by lots and lots of different researchers. And that's really good to know. That's really important for curriculum development. It's really important for designing services. But how do we get from that to the individual? So one of the things we might do, um, for example, in a research um, context is uh, this is the lab um, this is uh, one of our former RAs who was also a, a very good athlete um, this is on a loop so hence he keeps jumping although he could do this all day long um, and you'll see he's got motion tracking markers on him and then there's a, a very simple rendition of that he's on force plates embedded on the floor so we can measure some forces we can measure some movements we can also put um, devices on to measure uh, various other parameters such as um, muscle activity and if I then oops no go back <laughs> I'll share some 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 more group data this is some data we um, we collected uh, with the professional golfers association and it was elite golfers with uh, low back pain or no low back pain um, and uh, this is really rather beautiful data and um, what you've got here in, in, in the middle with the, the lines here, this is the moment of the ball strike. Um, everything starts at, at zero um, on the left hand side and that's the still period when they're addressing the ball. And if you have a look particularly at the bottom, this is a movement, I was struck with Alex's interpretation of the um, algorithm that there was a lot of rotational movement, horizontal plane rotational movement. Um, and again, this is very much a horizontal plane rotation movement. And you can see these are, we've got about 25 uh, golfers in each group and they're incredibly similar in the way they move, okay? So you think this could be a really variable movement. It's incredibly similar, especially in this, horizontal plane, the bottom layer here. And I just want you to keep a, a, a handle on this um, similarity. And you see, there's not much difference between the groups really. Um, but if we then look at amateur golfers, now this is displayed as individual traces rather than grouped and mean traces. But again, you've got the same thing. The zero point here is the ball strike um, on the X axis. The zero on the Y axis is the addressing of the of, of the ball and what you'll see if you look at that bottom line again it's fairly tight there's a few people doing some random things there's a bit of dodgy data in there too probably but if you look at the other two planes they're all over the place they're incredibly variable and the difficulty that we have is that we have to try and, try and take this golfer with low back pain or this runner with knee pain or the hipidemic of hip pain that we see in dancers and that we, we, we have the National Dance Medicine Clinic and try and translate these kinds of findings into that individual. And really, uh, I guess my message will maybe come back to a little bit. I want to make some space for Andy and Ellie is that we see these elite dancers, elite golfers, amateur golfers, Joe Public, the weekend warrior, the, the, um, the person who has a physical occupation or a sedentary occupation. And really we have to try and make that link between movement and, and pathology for each of those individuals. These are people obviously with musculoskeletal problems, with problems with the locomotor system. So that's the kind of data that we're dealing with and the kind of motions that we're dealing with. And I'll talk a bit more about individuals in a second, but I'll stop sharing there and, um, and hand over to, um, I think we said Andy would go next. Um, and we'd have a couple of questions for Andy. 
Thank you, Dan. Um, yeah, no, I suppose my job then is to take the clever research that you do in your lab and try and instill it into elite athletes, elite dancers. And that's where I sort of, that's my job, basically. My job is to, to manage a team that looks after everything involving the, the dancers' health. Um, and with that, I've been at UMB now for two years, and I suppose I've then had a, the honour of trying to form the, the basis of a good medical team that collects data so we can make informed decisions. Um, and when I say data, I sort of look at a number of injuries, so we need to understand how, who, how, how long someone is out of dancing for, how many days they're lost per year, per, per thousand hours, um, so how, how, where those injuries occur. So if it's a foot, an ankle, so when we look at my data so far, we're looking at around 85 to 95%, depending on which year you look at. With COVID, it's a massive shift just because there hasn't been a huge amount of dance, so the data has shifted a bit and we'll have to wait a few years to get some more consistency on that. Um, if you look at all levels of dance across all of the different papers, you anywhere up from 50% um, of injuries are all on the lower limb. So there's a high number there. What does the dancer do as well? I need to try and understand what the dancer does, not on an artistic sheet of saying how long they're dancing for, but actually what do they do in the studio? Because if I, I need to know that to be able to then return them from an injury. Unfortunately, injuries do happen. And now my job is to reduce the incidence of recurrence, but also trying to expedite the return to elite dance. Um, so I need to understand what that dancer is doing on in a nutcracker performance. If they're going into a, a doing 20 shows, 30 shows over the whole of December, I need to be able to understand what that load looks like so my rehab can, can uh, prepare them ready for that. Um, and then returning them to dance as well, understanding what the average and you know, an elite dancer's calf raises endurance would be, or how much they can push a leg machine, or how many squats they can do. Um, they're very unspecific to dance, but they are a good mediator to be able to understand that when we return them to dance, they're not going to get injured again. And that's my job as a clinician is not to put someone in harm's way um, because the dancer will always want to dance and the same as rugby, they'll always want to play, but it's my job to protect them from their later lives that they don't end up having issues. So it's trying to sort of educate the dancer. Are they ready to perform? Do they understand the risks um, and then be able to perform? Because the worst thing is to try and do something, but then not be themselves. If your principal dancer looks lame when they're coming out to do Swan Lake, then I'm um, no one's going to be very happy the dance of the people paying money to watch it and also um, the artistic team so just trying to understand that um, is is probably what I do from a data point of view and hopefully that sort of just understands and then I think Dylan and I and Elizabeth will be then just having a discussion once Elizabeth has chatted for a bit. Thanks then. Um, shall I go more into the details or we wait for more questions for Dylan and Andy? Um, just, if you could just tell us a bit more about the project, yeah. because I think there's yeah. there's a useful segue between, I think, the perhaps the sort of pedagogical or educational aspect of what, what Andy was just talking about in his work with the dancers that maybe um, yes. sort of connects with some of what you're doing. Uh, yes, because I also use data and uh, part of my data are connected to fine movement. Maybe I can share just a is another image to make the point clear. So um, this is the setting that we have at the moment. I don't know if you can see my, my slide. And you see again, the, the square that I uh, outlined before. And we have here the dancer and choreographer. Uh, and you see another, another student that is just learning the choreography. So we have a problem here uh, that we want to solve is to quantify the precision of the movement uh, and to provide feedback. So this data can be used uh, for uh, education and teaching, but this data also can be used to track uh, uh, with the precision that is required for ballet, also for physiotherapy. So the issue here of data is uh, about using the data to measure and then deploy what we, we learn for um, health so to try and understand what movements are done correctly, but at the same time, at the level of precision that is required for ballet and to um, try to communicate to the dancers. And why we might want to do this, one thing is simply to um, probably measure their improvement of measure what they are doing, but also from the psychological point of view, it can also help them to understand at what uh, 
at what stage in the process of learning they are and to have a reasonable understanding that maybe sometimes when with their perfectionism they think that they are going not so well in fact they are already achieving something that is good enough or they can understand what are the strengths and what are the weak points in a more objective way i don't know if you have comments on this i would love to to hear your your thoughts thanks elizabeth that's that's super interesting um so i think we, we have some time to have some questions between you uh dylan you have your your hand raised yeah, I was just going to say, Ellie, I think it's really exciting. This is uh, research monies that you've you've chased and, and got really brilliantly, um, which are in response to the pandemic. And um, I think there's a, a important thing here about um, taking what we learn in this elite setting and this really specialist setting and applying this across the board. And we've seen personal trainers out in the parks with people. We've got physiotherapists working online. Uh, we've got choreography and, and dance lessons happening online. Um, and I think it's a comment perhaps for you to respond to, but this, if, if this is successful, and I'm sure we're gonna be successful to, to a degree, but if it's as, as successful as we want, um, potentially you've got this tool that can be used so broadly for injury rehab, for training, for prevention, um, and, and really and taking what we learn from, from these elite, these amazing, amazing people and, and applying it to people like us, anybody, you know. Thanks, Dylan. I see a question. Let me read. Uh, uh, so um, Maria asked, uh, uh, shape tracking is not translatable equivalent to improvement in ballet technique. Are we only looking at shape forms only? No. At the moment, basically, we are working at um, uh, trying to understand what would be the best way to quantify. So uh, we want to compare uh, a dancer uh, with uh, his or her own body, and that would be a comparison in time but also comparing with uh, a task that can be performed in choreography. So can we use uh, an automated uh, uh, tool to tell, for instance, a dancer that is learning from home when the choreography that is learning uh, goes to the right instead the dancer is going to the left? So there are different ways of measuring. And uh, I think an interesting, um, an interesting way of categorizing the aspects of dance can be the direction in space, the position of the segments uh, with respect to the own body, and the, the timing. Then, of course, there is a lot of quality of movement, but just to start and to make those measurements that both Dylan and Andy uh, said that are important to also for the health, do we have a, an objective measure just to start addressing, I think, the three categories, direction in space, position of the segments of the body and uh, uh, time? Uh, Maria, I don't know if you have comments on this, uh, if you think uh, this would be interesting or if you have other ideas, it would be good to, to hear. That would be great. P perhaps we come back to that uh, in, in a little while. Um, were there any questions for Andy or, or Dylan that you wanted to ask across one another? I had one for Andy, if, if not. I'm ready, Martin. Okay. <laughs> question for Andy in the chat from Aoife Martin. Ah, okay. Um, well, it, my, my question for you first, Andy, was, was really just to do with, um, you, you were telling us yesterday uh, about the relative novelty um, compared to elite sport of, of the introduction of this kind of very close analysis of movement uh, in dance. And I wondered if you had any reflections on that. You were speaking very interestingly about how you had in the past had very sort of uh, acute knowledge of movement data of rugby players, for example, yeah. but that, you know, now coming to work with uh, a different group of people who are sort of movement specialists, actually the, the data on what they do in terms of movement has been relatively scarce up to now. Yeah, um, of course, I can go into that. Um, in rugby, it's been driven by money, it's been driven by needing to win at the weekend. So injuries are, and there's been good research coming out that if you get reduced injury rates, you're likely to be higher up the league in football, rugby, cricket, and every sport I can think of, to be honest. So 
that money is driven to be to be put into understanding what's likely and predict injuries, therefore to reduce injuries. So on any one day, we would have data in the rugby world of their GPS, how far they've run, what their high speed running is, what their high speed average is, um, what their heart rate has been, what their heart rate max has been, their heart rate variability over a period of time to look at fatigue between over a week to week basis. We would then could go into things, if it's a female sport, you'd look at menstruation because you know, I would then manage the mm-hmm. female's team. So we'd look at menstruation cycles to be able to reduce and increase load. Um, you could then be looking at, on a Monday, you'd get on the screen in all the dance also all the players um, to post the game to look at their movement dysfunctions their movement qualities from what the game has taken out of them so you could then manage their load for that training week to get them to the next friday or saturday so they're in an optimum position and that theory has then been driven out with having three you know we had three sports scientists that would be looking at the data that we could collect on every player uh, they would have an app that every morning they wake up they would say how well they've slept how well what their color their pee is uh, so we knew the hydration levels are they feeling happy are they feeling unsad are they broken up with their girlfriend boyfriend um so we could try and manage that situation to reduce the, the likelihood of injury now we'd never stop injuries a collision sport would be there but we would always see Collision injury is something that is probably inevitable, but we would want to reduce um, overuse injuries because it's something that if it's overuse, we can reduce the burden and therefore reduce injuries, which then takes me into this very interesting world of being in dance where the contact injuries just do not happen. Of course, they do very seldom. You know, someone is dropped from a lift or something, but the numbers are much, much, much smaller. Um, these are overuse injuries. So if I take my head back to the meetings I used to be in when we have an overuse injury in sport, in rugby, football, or cricket, that would be something that we would try and say that we could reduce it. So then moving into when 80, 90% of our injuries in dance are overuse injuries, we would just start wanting to try and reduce that, that burden and reduce that, that injury burden so you've got your dancer on an opening night when you want her there, he is there. So that's what I've been doing over the sort of the last two years is building the right team um, in place to support and understand that data and then slowly trying to start understanding what the dancer does on a day-to-day basis clearly there's been a bit of um, a a culture shift is needed for that because as soon as you start knowing stuff about people it gets a bit scary Um, knowing what your color appears first thing in the morning what you know how you've slept um, (laughs) where does that information go Uh, why am I asking that information it's not the kind of thing you normally ask Um, and I think that's come from just tradition, um, but they're not used to having that scrutiny paste on them. Um, there's also a bit of a reluctance that they see themselves as athletes always, um, and I don't believe they are athletes, but I think we can learn a lot from athletes because they are putting the 100% into their bodies and we're wanting to keep them fit and well to do what they need aesthetically. Um, and then most of them are athletic, um, and that's when it gets difficult and a bit very opinionated on are they an athlete? Are they a performer? But they are an athletic performer. And I know I'm sitting on the fence there, but that's my way of keeping everyone, that's my way of keeping everyone happy. It's nicely done. <laughs> um, I've done this before. Um, and, and I suppose that that data that we're needing to build up is to understand what a dancer does. It'd be how high they jump, how many jumps they're doing, what rotations they're putting through. Because especially at EMB, we're going from a very classical piece where we you know we could be doing one, uh, we could be doing Nutcracker in the Coliseum in December and then moving into something quite contemporary later in the, in the same place. Mm-hmm. But two days later, we could move into a completely different repertoire. Um, so it's trying to understand that at present, the bigger companies are trying to understand it, but you know, because it's not actually been done properly in the labs yet to fully understand and be able to pull out what those movements are, then you get into the into sort of elite level and I don't have the time or we don't have the skills and staff to be able to run through huge amounts of data sets to be able to pick out how many big jumps they do, how many jetes they do. And that's the kind of information the artistic team will want. They don't want to know how far someone moves across the pitch. I can put a GPS pitch up and put them, but they don't move very far. It's more those specific ballet, specific movements that are in the terminology that an artistic team would understand to be able to manage that information and interpret it. Um, because it's never the medical's job, in my opinion, to stop people doing it. It's about giving the dancer and the artistic team that information to be able to then make the informed decision. Because if it's a World Cup final, that person's playing uh, and the same if it's opening night and they can physically do it they're probably going to do it um so hopefully that gives some understanding of what over the over the next few years of where i'm going to be trying to look at getting sort of research funding to actually start understanding how we can implement the same similar um, sports science 
um, understanding and sport as in dance. And that's sort of across the board now, Australia Ballet, Royal Ballet, us, Birmingham Ballet, the bigger companies are starting to, start to break that up in that, that conversation. And I think once classical ballet gets it, it'll be something that's very interesting to put into all ballet, so all dance uh, genres. Because once you get an algorithm or something that can understand to pick up the movements, um, so, you know, we have an accelerometer as well, I assume you'll be using. Um, and it's then trying to pick that out and you can use it in all genres. So it's quite an exciting time for dance. Mm. I think that dance medicine sort of link will be uh, key. Great, thank you. Um, great to end uh, a moment of excitement. <laughs> thank you. And I think it's really interesting also, uh, and one of the things I've been so interested to hear Andy talk about is the, the extent to which you know, the, 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 so much of this data is sometimes thought of as being abstracted from context, but actually the really important thing here is really understanding it within context, it seems to me, in terms of also the, the kind of cultures of those contexts. And obviously we're hearing uh, so interestingly from Andy about the, the, the real difference between the way this, that uh, that cultural context of dance and the dance studio and training workshop and so on differs from the training ground of the rugby pitch or the, the cricket ground or what have you. Really interesting, thank you. Um, again, I'm sure we could keep this particular conversation running and running, but um, I'm obliged to move us on, I'm afraid. So um, if I could turn to uh, Yanis now, Yanis Patras, uh, another colleague from Queen Mary. So Yanis, if I could ask you to introduce yourself, I think you've got also got some uh, material to present us and to talk through first. Uh, yes, hi, thanks uh, very much for the, uh, for the, for the invitation. I will uh, uh, share my screen and use it in order to uh, present a little bit of the research that we are doing in my group. I am a professor of uh, computer vision and uh, human sensing in uh, the School of Electronic Engineering and Computer Science. And uh, the work that we are, uh, that uh, my team is uh, doing <coughs> is in the field of computer vision and machine learning. And basically we are designing computer systems that can look at people. So with cameras, they can analyze images and image sequences and can uh, uh, understand, uh, uh, analyze, uh, measure facial expression or uh, things on faces, uh, body postures, body gestures, the context in which something is uh, uh, taking place and uh, recognize different uh, things at the different levels of um, anal uh, at the different levels. So uh, here we're recognizing uh, facial expression. So for example, smiles, we're recognizing frowns, we're recognizing uh, um, uh, uh, lifting of the spatial um, uh, opening of the mouth. And then we're trying to associate those with things like um, uh, affective states or emotional state. Um, we're doing analysis on what do those uh, expressions mean in uh, the context of uh, mental uh, health. For example, uh, depression or uh, schizophrenia, we have worked a little bit on that. And uh, uh, then on uh, uh, the research that we have on body posture and uh, gesture, we're trying to uh, localize uh, joints on the human body. So detect uh, the pose, uh, detect uh, people in images and image sequences and analyze what they are uh, doing. So recognize their, uh, 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 what action is uh, taking place and uh, where it is taking place. And all of those are uh, in image sequences, so they have a temporal dimension. Another research that I'm doing is on uh, uh, analysis of brain signals, but I think that this is not so much related to it. What uh, is related is the fact that it is also a dynamic signal, so there are things that are changing in time. Um, I'm not so sure where I should go from, uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from here. Um, I can show you some of the results on one uh, area that we have uh, worked on, and this is on analysis of uh, uh, emotions in public spaces. So we are uh, there, the idea is to detect faces in public uh, uh, places like um, a pub or in a retail environment. And after we detect to uh, recognize their emotional state. Actually, here we were just trying to uh, detect uh, smiles. So as to uh, extract a kind of a delight index for the space so as to understand what is the ambience let's say of the uh, of the of, of the place and here are some are some results that um, actually maybe i should present here uh, because maybe the videos will play automatically then so here we can see some 
I'm sorry, the presentation is not uh, very, very smooth. But perhaps you can see here some of the results here. You can see that the detection of the faces is with uh, black boxes. And then whenever we detect that there is a smile taking place, you can see also the uh, red box uh, being uh, uh, activated. And we do that uh, here only for the smiles, but uh, we can have other uh, behaviors as well. Um, I'm not going to stay much more uh, here. Um, we are using similar methodologies in order to recognize action. So for example, things like um, uh, in video, somebody is riding a horse or in this video, uh, there is a, um, uh, people playing basketball or someone playing golf. We're not doing an analysis of whether at this moment or whether this is uh, done correctly or not, but this is something that could be using the representations that we are extracting is something that could uh, uh, be done as well. At the level of accuracy is something that we would have to uh, uh, look at. I have prepared some slides also on what kind of, uh, uh, how we represent and how we measure motion. But maybe I should uh, stop without uh, going into uh, details uh, here so as to uh, give some space to other people. Uh, thanks, Yanis. Thanks very much. Do you mind closing your screen? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. So, could you tell us? So, this is uh, you're you're doing this usually from video. Is there any capacity to do this um, kind of in real time through through the computer vision, or does it does it need to slow the material down in order to analyze it? So, uh, so far as the measuring of the motion is concerned, then all of these things can be done in real time. Right. Uh, so far as the recognition of the actions uh, is uh, taking uh, place, uh, again, uh, um, so some of the things, for some of the things, uh, for some of the actions, you need to have it uh, completed in order to recognize it. But there is a lot of work also in uh, predicting an action before it has been completed. I haven't worked on that. But uh, it, is, uh, it is an active uh, area that um, I would know how to, how to address it. I think that perhaps connects to a question that Elisabetta was putting in the chat. But Elisabetta, if, if you want to unmute yourself and ask the question live and direct, that would be great. Thank you. Yes, uh, that was very interesting. I was curious about the, you mentioned the temporal dimension. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind because there are different ways and i was curious if you can say something more um yes so um what we are currently doing that we have different ways of um, uh, taking time into consideration and currently all of the methodologies that we are using are based on those uh, deep uh, networks uh, um um I, I do not know how well you know uh, know them but the main idea is that you consider the um, um, you consider the uh, the measurement. So, for example, the intensity of a pixel, or the uh, motion vector that captures how a pixel moves uh, from one image to the next. We consider them as uh, a signal, and uh, that signal it has uh, variations. So, uh, a neural network takes this uh, special temporal volume that contains the signal. And then from there, it extracts some characteristics. So for example, some frequencies, it, uh, uh, representations that we currently do not know exactly what, uh, they, uh, uh, what they are. We can visualize them later, but um, um, it, is a, it, is a, it is an active area of research to try to go from what the neural networks do to something that the humans can uh, interpret. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not so very... <laughs> no, I, it's very interesting. So it's about the, the patterns, as we said before, of the temporal dynamics. So we go back to the idea of the pattern that uh, also Alex uh, was um, uh, discussing before uh, with Thomas, right? So thank you. Yes. Thank you. Perhaps that's perhaps that's a nice moment in, in which we might um, we, we might open things out as you've, you've usefully looped us back to the very beginning of the discussion, Elisabetta. Um, it, it just strikes me that there's there's something so interesting uh, across these different conversations, which is to do with 
with different kinds of translation from movement into data, into visualization and back into movement and so on. I'm, I'm really struck by that. And I'm really struck by how, although much of what we've been hearing about is dealing with, let's say, some, um, some very kind of um, advanced technology in terms of gleaning the data from the movement, that this abstraction of um, this abstraction of, of data or information about dance in particular and, and movement uh, and its re-representation for use back in dance actually has a really long history in the art form. So the very beginning of choreography um, in, in, uh, in Western performance practice begins of course with, with efforts to kind of notate dance. So we've got the very early ballet notations moving into the uh, the, the the more complex notation system that's become known as uh, Laban or Bartniev no notation uh, through the 20th century. Um, but the sophistication with which we can now um, abstract data and represent it and make it available and new uh, is kind of quite staggering, and not only in its complexity, but as I think we saw from Alex in, in some of its 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 beauty as well um, as as a new form of uh, of aesthetic. Um, it's it's just terrific to hear about. So I wondered if there are um, questions perhaps that the panelists have for one another, perhaps moving across these three different um, short presentations that we've heard from this evening. I suppose I have one, Martin, uh, to Yanis. Um, I suppose just linking into what I was saying about the need for me to understand what the dancer does, I suppose using this technology, you would rather than sort of strapping like in sport, you'd strap a GPS unit onto their back or you could put them an accelerometer onto their shins um, is what we did. You know, we did a three week um, sort of just trial for it and the amount of data was humongous. Maybe you'd film you know, you know, and maybe Bill Linking and Alex Alexander for this as well. But if you were an artistic, you, most people are going to film them. You could then probably draw the same data that Alex um, was looking at for his master artistically. You would then be able to pick out what they are doing from a load point of view to understand how hard a particular movement or how 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 many jumps or how many rotations they're going. I don't know if that was something that was just it was. It seemed to link between all three of us. To be honest, that's where my head was going. Uh, if I can take it, uh, yes, uh, I was thinking uh, exactly the same when you were uh, talking about the need of uh, understanding what they are doing. So uh, I can confidently say that we would be able to uh, recognize uh, uh, and count uh, rotations uh, and type of uh, type of movements. Uh, uh, Hints that I have, I have uh, is that uh, we are far from understanding the uh, measuring from the vi from uh, visual from the visual from uh, from um, uh, cameras, uh, how the impact or the forces that are on uh, the human on the human body. That I would be interested in uh, trying to see whether this is uh, feasible to be measured um, uh, by constructing data sets in which you have both the computer vision, so the, both the films and uh, data from the accelerometers. But uh, I don't know anybody else who has done that. That, that I just kept coming with something. Sorry, Sorry. I was just going to say it, I think it, it it relates to an interesting point in 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 terms of the the ability of this kind of technology to accurately capture movement and and one of the most challenging things it seems is is capturing the or accurately representing the relationship of contact with the ground, um, which obviously relates to load and and how forces are moving through the body, but also is something that we really intuitively relate to and the, uh, you know that often makes this um, footage when it's captured and, and re-represented re or kind of simulated um, a bit kind of weird uh, and it kind of tends to fall into the uncanny valley because we, we know that there's something not quite right about it. It's amazingly advanced obviously in what it's capable of doing but it's something that I'm always um, really interested in looking at is when often when you try and make it look too too much like um, it does in real life, it um, it falls into that weird territory. So the abstraction of it, the att actually moving it away from um, what it tends to look like um, in reality um, is more interesting uh, for me, but I think often in, uh, is a successful way of kind of um, 
uh, getting around the inconsistencies um, of these forms of capture. Yeah, thank you, Alex. I, I, I think it's, it's interesting looking at the work that you shared between the, the visualization and then the use of the avatar showing that the, the precision of the movement capture actually, yes, the, I, for me at least anyway, the, uh, the visualization was more satisfying than the, the avatar. Mm -hmm. um, I just, uh, just I have a half an eye to time. So as chair, um, I also want to make sure that we do involve some questions that we're having from our audience. I've got a question here from, uh, from Aoife that I'm just going to read out. And then I'm aware, I've just noticed that there's a couple of uh, questions coming from the Q&A. So I'll, I'll, uh, if you've asked a question in the q and I'll, I'll read that while um, hopefully our panelists are responding to Aoife and, and then I'll, I'll try and make sure that I address your question in a moment. So Aoife uh, is, uh, asking she's saying I'm interested by the commonality here around measurement uh, in inverted commas as a way to produce knowledge what do the panelists who do this think isn't captured or is missed out by the act of measurement so I guess that's probably being addressed to Dylan Elizabeth Yanis and Andy and the First I'm very, very happy to, to answer that. I, I may have some interruptions. I've got uh, a cat fight going on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I guess emotion is, is, is one of those things. That's what the, what the cat fight is making me think about. What the question is a good question, Aoife. Um, and it actually made me think about the clinical practice during the pandemic where we've been doing everything in two dimensions, um, pretty much. Um, and the technology has really... Um, helped us a lot there's been an explosion of new technology in terms of video conferencing with patients that's secure that interacts with the medical records and so on and a lot of people initially were very positive about this and there was good reason to be positive we were able to keep people in their homes and give them some advice have them assessed and 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 kept safe and improving quite often um and then as time's gone on it's really pulled um, and, and the limitations have become really clear, not just not being able to get hands on people, but all the nonverbal um, communication, all the, I think none of these measurements are really collecting information about the emotion that's expressed uh, in movement, um, about body habitus, um, all the nonverbal communication and so on, and, and the, uh, the subtleties are are lost. Yanis is, is picking up sort of, you know, the smile is probably uh, one of the easier emotions to go for, but, you know, a smile can mean a hundred things. And, and I, think, I, think, um, I think that's what we've really missed in clinical practice is the subtleties, as well as just some whole things about handling people and so on. Um, and it'll be interesting to see where we end up, because there's a big push to try and keep as much uh, clinical practice remote as possible. Um, and I'm, I'm pushing the other way, actually. I think we need to get back to uh, some of the analog face-to-face -face in person, but augmented with, with what we've learned and what we're continuing to learn. If I can answer also the related question by Thomas about the amount of data to generate. I think this is a good point. So maybe, I don't know if I can share this other image, if you can see. Uh, basically here, I was playing a bit with the, uh, the joints that are used for the lab annotation, which, which is a way I use to uh, describe and annotate the movement of dancers. Uh, and we can easily use that literature to try and understand what are the important part that we want to, uh, what do we want to follow. So maybe we want to reduce the problem, in my case, to the uh, joints and try to focus on the uh, agreement or disagreement uh, uh, with alignment of, of, of the joints. So this is, was just uh, to mention a strategy that we can use to uh, try to simplify this amount of data, but it's true, um, as if it was mentioning, we are using neural networks to uh, to track the position of, of the dancer. Uh, can I, shall I try to address uh, actually maybe a little bit both of the questions now that uh, I often Thomas uh, here to, uh, have put. So 
so far as I understand it, uh, currently when you were trying to recognize things or to analyze things or to um, uh, try to comprehend uh, some phenomena, uh, uh, you were trying to reduce the problem. So you were trying to pick up what are the measures that you think that are more, what are the features that you think that are more uh, relevant for your problem, design and measure only those so that you get to something that it is uh, uh, more manageable but uh, also something that you think that uh, it would um, 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 help you gain some understanding uh, of the problem. Uh, more and more now, it becomes a big data problem in which you just uh, feed the data to the machine and then uh, somehow you let it uh, uh, extract the characteristics that are important for the uh, end goal. So for example, for the uh, recognition, for example, of the of the action in our case, or for the recognition of the emotion in uh, in 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 in, uh, in my case, um, it is uh, it is uh, well. Uh, in the end, you're designing systems that uh, can uh, uh, solve to a certain degree the problem that you design them to solve, but. Uh, how far they uh, gain, they um, um, they contribute to understanding really what is going on and how much you are missing. It is, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the jury is out there. So to uh, to see what um, what the result of that will be. But in any case, this is uh, where things are going at the moment. Okay, thank you. That that's. That's super interesting. I, I see from reviewing the uh, Q and A finally that I, I think that the questions that were asked by that channel uh, have been kindly addressed by the the panelists that they were that they were put to. Um, are there any other questions from uh, from our audience that anyone would like to put either through the Q and A or or through the chat? I'm, I'm happy to relay those. Otherwise, I have further questions I can ask. Okay, well, perhaps while somebody is typing, um, I guess what, what's been really, in, again, sort of coming back to something I was thinking about before, really, in terms of act of translation, I, I, I think we, we, have, um, we have such an interesting group of people gathered, but I guess Alex is our sole representative from the, uh, the, 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 the uh, I guess the artistic application of some of this material. And I suppose, Alex, what do you, what do you think are the, the, the next ways in which you might approach some of the use of data? Not necessarily um, what we've been hearing about this evening, although that would be incredibly interesting, but where, where do you think you might go next? Good question. Um, I mean, I'm really interested in the different forms of data that can be derived from the body and movement. And um, I guess the, the forms of feedback that you were referring to before in terms of the, the extraction of data and then kind of feeding it back into the, the process, um, uh, into the artistic process. And I, I think, um, I mean, I'm obviously interested in, in, in developments in technology and that, um, in ways that that movement can be recorded and digitized and then worked with artistically once it's been um, recorded and I guess some of the developments at the moment seem to be around um, the transition from motion capture into volumetric capture into this kind of photorealistic um, forms of capture that bring um, I guess a lot more detail of the the look of the body um, which um, I guess in artistic terms um solves some problems because with with motion capture you know you are um ultimately reducing the body in all its detail down to a set of data points you know 32 points in space and there's amazing algorithms that fill in the gap um between those points um but ultimately there's a lot of work to do to then build something back on top of that um and often you know in the the high-end Hollywood studios pile millions or billions of dollars into accurately simulating the the look of the human body, and there's a big drive, you know, certainly from the 
um, computer games industry to to really accurately simulate um, the look of the human body. I'm kind of more interested in the in the opposite side of that of the, the abstraction um, rather than the faithful um, uh, recreation of it. But then I guess with um, with yeah with volumetric capture you kind of you don't encounter that problem in a way that that the, you you get something that ultimately looks a lot more like um, how a real person moves and 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 therefore um, you don't really need to worry too much about this problem of either trying to recreate or abstracting and you can work with with um, with that form in a way that um, I guess you know a lot of the issues we've been encountering recently in terms of um, how to how, you know what what um, uh, online experiences of movement and dance and you know live theatre performances like and the and the frustrations of the flatness of screens um, again you know this is one of the real advantages I I see of this technology is that if you can capture movement in its three dimensionality you can then um, provide an experience of it. Um, in that detail digitally um, uh, you know the technology is still quite a long way for, uh, away from easily facilitating that but it's been really interesting to see the how um, that uh, there's been an accelerated drive behind that because of the, the the situation we've encountered and and I think you know the, the, all of these technologies offer really interesting possibilities um, for uh, both understanding movement um, from the perspective of you know, physiotherapy and uh, movement analysis um, and learning um, and uh, as well as um, understanding it from from the perspective of the kind of questions that a choreographer brings to movement in terms of, you know, the things that I was touching on a bit before around um, are kind of exhausting possibilities. There's a different kind of possibility set that opens up when you suddenly, when you're dealing with movement on these terms and, and, and um, with these ways of representing it so um i guess uh yeah for me it's really interesting to see where what the what the drive behind the technology is um from the industries that have the money to push it forwards and then how the arts can kind of co-opt that and um and um reimagine how those systems and the pro and you know the priorities that often come with them can be reconsidered um because often you know as again as i pointed to before um, there's a very different kind of outcome or intended outcome um, um, or motivation behind these uh, artistic inquiries um, uh, compared with the kind of scientific and quantitative um, inquiries that, that um, often drive the development of the technology. Thank you. Super interesting. I mean, it's, it, it is, however, fascinating to kind of hear about the, the, the points of contact, correlation, crossover and so on. It feels, it feels, uh, I know, this is an ongoing concern, but it does feel like a, a, a very interesting point in relation to the kind of two cultures that we lived through with the, the 20th century, where art and science were believed to kind of live quite separate, separate lives. I think it's very exciting to, to have this kind of conversation and, and hear about those points of, of, of correlation and crossover, which is great. Um, so th there is a question actually for you, Alex, which unfortunately I think we're not really going to have to get some time to get to, but you might perhaps give a, a quick thought to in the in the chat, perhaps even directing towards your you, the materials that I think you have on your website that might uh, that might help to illustrate some of what you're doing with data in your choreography, Alex. Um, it's it's just gone quarter past, so I'm aware I think that we have to finish it quarter past uh, unless I'm about to be told otherwise because I, I could listen to a lot more of this discussion um, if we were allowed um, but if I have to bring it to a close I'm afraid I'm going to have to I, I would just note also um, just how fascinating it has been to hear about about movement and just about movement kind of in and of itself and and what we might learn about one another uh, on that basis and it really just reminds me of uh, some work in a in a in a different field uh, within the academy in philosophy uh, by the American philosopher Maxine Sheets Johnston who who uh, has produced an enormous body of work over the years largely grounded in dance 
uh, in which she looks also uh, to science, to evolutionary theory, in a move to really put forward our experiences of movement as being central to our understanding of what it is to be human. So I think I might just leave it there with that idea that what really connects all of these things is the fact that it's getting at something really fundamental about what it is to be human. We come into the world as moving beings, she says. <laughs> um, and you can contest that or agree with her as you wish, but we, we've gone over time. So I think I'm going to have to draw it to a conclusion here. But I would just want to uh, applaud and thank our panellists very much and thank you all for coming along to uh, Queen Mary Zoom and listening to us this evening. Thank you very much.